This chapter actually begins prior to the Civil War. As we go through this chapter, it's not exactly going in order. It's more based on theme. So we're looking at Western development. Remember from the Civil War, not a whole lot of fighting went on in the West. So who was in the West? Well, of course, there were the Western types. We have those like the Cherokee, who had been relocated to Indian Territory, which is today Oklahoma. We've got the Pueblos, like in Arizona, New Mexico, that area. You know, they lived in adobe dwellings. We talked a little bit about those when we talked about the Spanish settlement. And we had the Pueblo Revolt. There was a very strict hi hierarchy as far as society was concerned, with the Spanish at the top, then the Pueblos, then those Apaches and Navajos who had been captured. They were kind of considered Indians without tribes, but it was very much based on racial heritage, this social hierarchy. Now in the Great Plains, we've got the more nomadic tribes. Culture was based on family networks, obviously the relationship with nature. The different tribes were divided into groups of about 500 members that we call bands. And the whole community was involved in the decision-making process. Tasks were divided by gender. The men were in charge of hunting, trading, religion, military. The women were domestic, artistic, gardening. The big thing about the Plains tribes is that they followed the buffalo, especially the Sioux. And when we talk about different Plains tribes in this time period, our focus will probably be more on the Sioux than any other group. They built temporary dwellings that left the landscape undisturbed. Buffalo was their main source of food, clothing, fuel, toys, tools, like they used bones for knives and arrows, the muscle tendons for bowstrings. So they used every part of the buffalo. Especially the Sioux, they were a warrior people. It was highly competitive to be considered the most fierce. But the problem with the Plains tribes is the same problem that we've seen with the Native Americans throughout in that they did not unite against white expansion. And as the whites came, they were exposed to disease, and then the whites were also economically and industrially advanced. Now, we have Hispanic America. New Mexico, California, Texas, Arizona's in that as well. If you recall, we had gained that territory after the Mexican War. And so prior to that, it had been controlled by Hispanics, by Spanish descendants. So now suddenly, there's whites, Anglo-Saxons coming in. And it really, the arrival of the whites changed the communities and the economies. Uh, people like General Stephen Kearney tried to exclude the Mexican landowners and the former Hispanic priests in the new government. Uh, you have the uh, Taos Re Indians rebelling and New Mexico is basically under military rules. And so Anglos used their money to eliminate Hispanic political and economic authority. The Americans came in, the whites came in, uh, squelched the Apache and Navajo. And so while the Hispanic population continued to thrive and control their society in some places, once the railroad reached, Anglo-Saxon presence and influence increased. And we find our Hispanic or Mexican population relegated to low-paying, unstable jobs. We ba whites basically usurped the Mexicans. California had been settled by, in the 1700s by Spanish missionaries. The Indians had been laborers. The missions had lots of land, livestock, and wealth. But under Mexico, the mission society weakened, 
and you had a Mexican aristocracy that arose based largely on uh, large estates, haciendas, but again, they're unable to resist English arrivals, white arrivals, because the white population is so large. Uh, expansion, debt, and droughts weaken them even more, and we see Mexicans relegated to the lower spectrum of the social class. They were working class in the barrios or farmhands. Similar problem uh, pattern in Texas. Now on slide two, looking at the Chinese. They had left China in search for better lives. China was very poverty stricken. So by 1880, 10% of California's population was Chinese, and they had developed a reputation for being very hard working. And in fact, the whites kind of resented their success, and laws came up that limited their possibility of success in the gold rush. And then we've talked about how not many people did strike it rich during the gold rush. So the Chinese had to find other employment. Well, at the time, the Transcontinental Railroad was being built. And so about 12,000 Chinese worked on the railroad. They provided 90% of the labor on the western branch, the Central Pacific branch. Reasons the railroad liked them, they didn't try to unionize. They were very hard workers, and they accepted low wages. And whites didn't want the job because it was very dangerous to think about building those railroads through the mountains. Those who did try to strike and unionize, they were isolated, basically starved, and that effort failed. What was going to happen to them after the railroad was finished in 1869? Most of them went back to the West Coast and ended up in cities like San Francisco and they opened laundries and grocery stores and tea houses, that sort of thing. One thing is that they were dominated by community organizations. We'll talk about political machines later, but it's kind of a political machine with which arranged employment, protection, social services, cultural celebrations in the Chinatowns. The Tongs, basically a Chinese mafia. They're secret societies, uh, criminal organizations involved in the opium trade and in prostitutions. Like the Mexicans, Chinese worked in the lowest professions. One reason the laundry was so success successful, they were cheap, they couldn't work in anything else, and they didn't really have to know a lot of English to be launderers. The Americans, the whites, didn't react well, and so we see the development of anti-Cooley clubs, which Cooley is a derogatory term for the Chinese, that encourage things like companies to not hire Chinese, boycott products made by Chinese labor. It ends up in violence, kind of a KKK aimed at the Chinese. And the Democratic Party actually takes up the anti-Chinese crusade, they create the Working Man's Party of California, and eventually we have the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned all Chinese immigration and naturalization. It protected American workers, and it reduced class conflict. Because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Chinese population declined by about 40%. Easterners who were coming west uh, most were from America. You were getting a larger group of foreign-born immigrants. A lot of Scandinavians and Germans were coming into the Midwest, Minnesota, that area. They were attracted by the gold and the silver. There was also a lot of farmland, grazing pastures. The railroad helped them expand because it was easier not only to get there, but to get the supplies that they needed there. The uh, Homestead Act had been passed during the war, and under the Homestead Act, you could purchase 160 acres for a small fee as long as you promised to work it for five years. 
So basically, it sounded like you were giving free land to people who had no other prospects. The reality is because of increased uh, technology and the cost of that, it was very difficult to farm 160 acres of land. And it was too small to make a profit off of grazing cattle when they would overgraze and for grain farming. And so not that many ended up abandoning their homesteads. There was also some fraud involved. Uh, huge corporations would have people register and then fail and uh, the huge corporations would seize, the, seize and they ended up with large groups of land. Uh, the government did pass like the Timber Culture Act, the Desert Land Act as an effort to give additional acre, acreage to try to make it more successful. Uh, Oklahoma stopped being Indian Territory about 1889 and whites started settling there. Arizona and New Mexico had a very small white population, most of it Democratic. Uh, Utah because of the Mormon practice of polygamy was denied statehood until 1896. As far as laborers, there weren't that many so it was necessary to recruit a labor force. So they, there were higher work wages because of the dangerous and hard working conditions. But there was no job security. And then you have the threat of, like the Chinese, accepting lower wages. So it's mostly single males. They were homeless. They were highly mobile. There was not a lot of opportunity to move up, which is not that different than the way it was in the East. The West was a very racially diverse population, but it was very divided. And there was a lot of ge genetic stereotypes. For example, that Mexicans were smaller and they were used to the heat, so they were better suited for those types of jobs. Moving on to the economy. Uh, a lot of the economy in the West is based on mining. Between the 1860s and 1890s, following the gold rush, which was, of course, 1849. And we have kind of three stages of the mining industry. The first people who come in are individuals and they use what's called placer or placer mining for shallow deposits, uh, you know, things like gold panning, uh, they, it's also sluice mining. After the shallow deposits could be hit, then corporations come in with the big machinery, the big equipment to go deeper called load mining, L-O-D-E, or quartz mining. Later, you have others come in for the permanent community. So some of the major strikes for gold, you have Pikes Peak near Denver in 1858, uh, the Washu uh, 1859, and then later they discovered the Comstock Lode, which is actually silver in Nevada. Early prospectors in both of these were from California, as were supplies. The Black Hills in South Dakota, that's discovered in 1874 and actually has an impact when we get into talking about Native American resistance. Almost as important are copper strikes such as the Anaconda in, Manico in Montana in 1881. You also have mining of lead, tin, quartz, zinc. Your boomtown culture, though, you would have a community spring up around the mine, and a whole lot of your population was not miners, but those who came to support the miners. But you also had an outlaw presence and vigilante justice. I really recommend the movie Tombstone to kind of get an idea of that. Few women, and then failed prospectors eventually become the workers for the big corporate mines. And the mining was hot work. You had pneumonia, uh, lung disease, explosion, cave in, very dangerous work. The other major 
industry that developed in the West at this time are your farms, actually your cattle ranches. And you originally had open range because nobody owned the land. Basically, it was public domain. And so people would have their cattle and they'd brand them and they'd let them go out and wander. And then when it was time to bring them in, you would have what's called the long drives, where the cowboys would take the large herds long distance along a particular trail to distant markets, and then the cattle would get on to the railroad to transport to the east. For example, Abilene, Kansas became the largest railroad town for cattle, and they would travel via the Chisholm Trail. But as farming expanded, the open range land ceased or decreased. Because the herd was made of cattle belonging to several ranches, or ran yeah, and the ranch was the base of operations until the arrival of farmers and sheep, and so then the ranchers were competing for that open grassland. The uh, the farmers and the sheep ranchers built fences and this was the invention of the barbed wire because that was a whole lot cheaper than wooden fences so you end up with range wars between the farmers and the cowboys competing for that land eventually the range becomes overstocked you have some severe winters and summers uh, the plain was scorched, thousands of cattle died, and in a few years the open range and long drive were gone, and you have the established fenced-in ranches. In West, more people had the opportunity to vote. It was kind of an attraction. Go West and you can vote, especially for single women. We do get the development of a romantic ideal of the West. The Rocky Mountain School of Art paints the Western landscapes. You uh, end up with resort hotels giving people that wilderness vacation. And then there's the cowboy myth. You know, this ideal that the cowboy was free from social constraints, close to nature, a symbol of virtue, decent, courageous, compassionate. And this myth was spread through popular culture, novels, stories, the Wild West shows like Buffalo uh, Bills. But actually the cowboy, it was low paid work, very tedious job, lonely, physically dis not comfortable, and there was really no effort for advancement. But the cowboy is symbolic of what's kind of known as the last frontier. This, the West, the Midwest was the last unsettled territory. It was the last opportunity to start new. Teddy Roosevelt thought the, play, the West was a place for physical regeneration. But the biggest is what we call the Turner Thesis, proposed by Frederick Jackson Turner. Basically, he said the frontier was ending, and the frontier, this frontier spirit had created the American uh, personality, the American stereotype. And so with the ending of the frontier, it was the end of a Democrat, the democratizing force. Now, the fact of the matter is, the West was never really empty, and there's still large amounts of un unoccupied land. But it was difficult to acquire valuable land. Basically, it was the end of opportunities to control your own destiny. Henry Nash Smith said that the West was a Garden of Eden and that garden was now gone. I talked about already the enclosing land for the cattle, the uh, the increasing of barbed wire. There's obviously not as much water in the east and in the west water is still a major issue today and the government has a control of a lot of the water issues. Uh, irrigation diverted water from rivers, there was battles and fights over
control of the water. And when there were droughts, like in 1887, makes things worse. Farmers lost farms. They would go deeper in debt and have to end up moving back east. As uh, far as commercial farming, they specialized in cash crops, but they were very dependent on the bank to loan them money to provide the tools that they needed. The bank had sole control of interest rates. They depended on demand. There was fluctuating prices. They relied on the world market to buy what they grew, but the they had competition in the world market. And then they end up overproducing. And we see this leading up into the Great Depression to be a continuing problem for our farmers. They were also, the railroads and the banks kind of had them over the barrel. The railroad charged high prices on freight and they operated the storehouses and charged high prices there. And the farmers had no choice if they wanted their product to get to market. Same with the banks. You didn't have a lot of banks and so they had to take the credit rate that was offered and then life was very isolated for the farmers in the West. It was lonely. For the Native American population, we have the continuing trend that we have seen since the beginning of the English coming to America. They would make a treaty. The treaty would be broken by the settlers. It was not enforced by the government. In the 1850s, the government enforces a concentration policy. The tribes give separate defined reservation and they're divided from each other and it gives the whites the most desirable land. In 1867 the Indian Peace Commission was established after a few bloody conflicts. The plan was to move all the tribes into two large territories Indian Territory, Oklahoma, and the Dakotas. They create the government of or the Bureau of Indian, and Indian Affairs, which is part of the Department of the Interior, which distributes land, makes payments, ships supplies, but it's a very poorly administered government commission. You also have the white slaughter of the buffalo. It became a trend. Remember I talked about the myth of the West and the Romanticism. And so to have a buffalo coat becomes a popular trend for clothing. The leather is used to make machine belts for the growing industry. Also, think about building the railroad. You come across, a the train's going through, comes across a herd of buffalo, it's going to cause a wreck. So basically the government offered bounties on the buffalo and the Indians helped to meet that demand. Also hurting the buffalo is the growth of homesteads and the reduction of open plains. The buffalo couldn't make their migrating patterns. But at the same time, this basically destroyed the Plains Indians' way of life. And most of our resistance here is going to talk about the Plains Indians. Uh, some of the early resistance, you had small raiding parties on wagon trains, stagecoaches, ranches. Uh, Little Crow led the Sioux in a raid in Minnesota where 700 whites were killed. In retaliation, 38 Indians were hanged and the tribes were exiled to the Dakotas. So, Indian, you had another group at Sand Creek. The Indians were offered protection if they would camp near the government fort. But you had local volunteer militia force, not the government, local volunteers, who attacked these Indians who had agreed to come in peacefully and thought that they were under protection. And so they were attacked by the civilians and it killed 133. 105 of the Indians who were killed were women and children. Chief Black Kettle escaped and he was later killed by General Custer. Red Cloud is a Sioux who prevented the road from Fort Laramie being built. And so you have white civilian vigilante groups killing many Indians. It is an extermination policy. So then in 
I mentioned the discovery of gold in the Black Hills in Dakota, where the Indians had been promised, go here, we'll leave you alone. Now there's gold, we want that gold. In 1875, you have a group of Sioux that leave the reservation and they unite under Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. And this united group attacks the 7th Cavalry, which is led by General Custer, at Little Bighorn in 1876. Custer's group is surprised and the entire 7th Regiment is killed by 2,500 Indians. But, as the trend has shown, the Indians couldn't stay united. Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse were both eventually killed on the reservation. The Nez Perce were on their way to a reservation when some white settlers were killed. Chief Joseph urged his people to flee to the Sioux and the U.S. Army chased them for 75 days, uh, almost into Canada. Joseph eventually surrenders. He has one of my favorite quotes about it. He says, I am oh, I'm tired, I am weary. From where the sun now sets, I will fight no more forever. The treaty that the army makes with the Nez Perce aren't, isn't honored and he's kind of shipped from place to place. He ends up in Indian Territory. For the Apache, they're led by uh, Colorados and Cochise and they negotiated a peace treaty that includes some traditional land. Geronimo does not agree to the treaty. He refuses to assimilate to become like the whites, and so he leads raids on white settlements, eventually does have to surrender. Wavoka leads a spiritual revival for the Sioux. He claims to be the uh, a spiritual guide, talks about the coming of the Indian Messiah, and there is this ghost dance, this mass emotional gathering, drumming, shouting, dancing. It's a, he promises a vision of the white stone and the buffalo's back. Well, obviously this ghost dance makes the whites very nervous. So the 7th Cavalry comes in and on December 29, 1890, at Wounded Knee, they try to round up 300 Sioux, and it ends up being a mass slaughter. And basically, Wounded Knee is the end, the battle that marks the end of the Indian Wars. There's really no resistance after that. The Dolls Act is passed. It changes reservation lands to private ownership rather than tribal ownership. The adults are given citizenship, but they're also they don't get the full title to their land for 25 years so that they aren't hoodwinked into selling it to somebody else. There is a policy of assimilation to try to make the Indians farmers like the whites. They promote Christianity. They send children to white-run boarding schools. Uh, the act is renewed in 1906, but it eventually, I mean, it's just not very successful, and we eventually see a change again, but not till nearly the Great Depression. If you'd like to learn more about the White Run Boarding Schools, a book that and movie that I recommend, it's a fictionalized account, but it's a very good one, is The Education of Little Tree.